Welcome to Resilient. My name is Mike Kearney, the Risk and Financial Advisory CMO. We have completed over 20 episodes in our Confronting the COVID-19 Crisis series. And what's crazy is that there's so many topics that we still need to cover related to the ongoing challenges of the pandemic and opportunities that are being presented on a daily basis. I have to say that is why I love the Resilient series. Today, we are gonna ask questions about risk to the nation's infrastructure. How do we build trust resiliency and security in a complex and interconnected world. How resilient is our nation's critical infrastructure? What risks are emerging? Are our public and private risk mitigation strategies to combat the threats keeping pace? And who is leading that effort to manage these risks? Bob Kalaski is who is helping keep us safe. Bob is the director of National Risk Management Center, which ultimately resides under the Department of Homeland Security. He brings a unique perspective, especially on how the crisis has impacted the 16 critical infrastructure sectors and the 55 national critical functions. The NRMC is really at the intersection of government and industry. And this is really important. It advises businesses, industry, and the government on how to best secure, protect, and keep resilient those functions that are so vital that their disruption would have a debilitating impact on the economy and our national safety. Let's hear what he has to say. So Bob, you are the man that sees risk everywhere, obviously in everything you do. But one of the things that we've heard, especially through many of our recent resilient interviews, is that hope is really what makes people resilient. So what hope do you have for the future? That's a good question. I like the way you frame it. I get asked a lot, sort of, what's the thing that keeps you up at night? And I always resist that question. <laughs> I, I, I'm sort of, the, the way I like to phrase it, what's the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning? And I, I think that's I really that. what we're talking about. You know, what, what gets us out of the bed, bed in the morning here is that, you know, my, my hope is that we have a number of smart people. We have a lot of committed partners across industry and the government. We have a lot of innovation out there to go go at the big problems facing the nation. You find hope in people. You, you find hope in the willingness to look hard at who we want to be as a nation, um, understand what's, what's the risk to that, and then get after the problem. You know what I love about that answer? And, and I do ask this in different forms in every interview I do. It's oftentimes um, about a circumstance in the future or something that an organization is doing, but you've cut it back to, I think, which is actually the most important thing to our future in, in really every industry, every sector, every issue we face. And ultimately it comes down to if you've got good people that are committed to do the right thing, you know, things will end up uh, in a good place. So I love that, that you actually uh, focused on kind of the, the people aspect of it. Um, Bob, I want to ask you just kind of to, to set the table, um, what is the focus, because this is going to be a term that many people haven't heard, but what is the focus of the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency, which is kind of a mouthful. So what is the focus? Sure. So, you know, the, the bureaucratic answer is we are the agency that's responsible for securing federal networks and working with the critical infrastructure partners around the country to make sure that critical infrastructure, energy, banking and finance, et cetera, are, are up and running. And so the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency really is in support of, of the nation's critical infrastructure and our federal networks. But we have a couple mm -hmm. pithy ways that we describe what we're doing. Um, one of which is, you know, we serve as the nation's risk advisor. We are out there and, and we're going to talk a lot about risk, but we are out there trying to understand risk and get information on how to reduce it into the hands of security professionals in the hands of planners in the, the hands of financial professionals so that they can do something to reduce risks. So we play a key advisory role. And then the other pithy way we describe it is, you know, we want to help defend today and secure tomorrow. We want to help up the, on the defend today. We, we want to be ready if anything happens today um, to be able to, um, you know, close vulnerabilities, anticipate threats, but, but we also then want to build toward a, a more secure tomorrow. Um, you know, as we do things like as a nation and as a globe, build out 5G networks, how can we make sure that's done securely and we can take advantage of all the increase in bandwidth and, and connectivity that's going to come with 5G and not be sitting back 10 years from now and say, oh, shoot, we didn't think about, you know, 
the, the ways that our adversaries might hit those networks. So, so we want to be focused both on what we have to do today, but also think about tomorrow. And then there's this National Risk Management Center. Um, so how does that connect with the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency? If you could just touch on that as well. Sure. So I run the National Risk Management Center within CISA. I'm one of the CISA assistant directors. And, you, you know, going back to the pithy ways, we, we really help um, develop the analysis to give the risk advice that, that CISA is in CISA's goals. And, and we really are focused on uh, particularly on the secure tomorrow aspect of CISA's mission. Um, the National Risk Management Center is a is a planning and analysis and collaboration center. It's a place that has the best information out there on how critical infrastructure works and risks to critical infrastructure. And we are capable of doing analysis in the face of whatever incidents or, or threats we're facing to understand how that those threats turn into risk and could propagate in the system. But it's more than the analysis. It's, it's in the planning and the collaboration. It's bringing industry and government together to do something about those risks, whether it is to secure 5G networks, whether it is to secure our elections. Um, we're doing a lot of work around um, information communications technology, supply chain security, um, we're thinking mm-hmm. about how you secure the GPS system, the position navigation timing long term. Um, so, so you know, when, when we see things that are kind of strategic risks to the nation's infrastructure, we put together the plans, we bring together the people to do something about the analysis to reduce risk. So what, I mean, it sounds like actually a really cool role. What led you um, to this role as the associate director of the NRMC? Patience and endurance. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I've, I've been with the Department of Homeland Security about 15 years doing um, risk and preparedness and, and infrastructure work. Um, my, my first most significant job in the department was really defining how the department approached risk management. And I wrote a lot of the, the f- foundational documents there. My background previously with the department, I was a consultant um, I did time as a journalist. I have a master's in public policy where I focused on particularly business and government policy and economics. And so it's a good background, I think, into this. Um, when, when Secretary then Secretary Nielsen established the National Risk Management Center, she was, I think, in, in selecting me, looking for somebody who understood the fundamentals of risk, had good experience working with industry, and enough experience to drive it really into action. And for me, it's a good combination of my experience and academic background. And I don't know, I, I think I'm a natural risk thinker in, in, in some ways. Right. And so I, I like I like thinking about the world in, in sort of organized frameworks. What's fascinating about it is your background in journalism, because one of the things that I find in the work that I do with a lot of risk leaders, um, you know, mostly at, at, at public companies and things of that nature, is the risk management professionals need to communicate effectively with people who aren't in risk because they see the world very differently. Do you think that journalism background has enabled you to do that? Because I've never... Quite frankly, that is not a common background of journalism background, but now you're in risk, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. So, you know, what, what I found as a journalist is, is often, and I, I was writing for one of the early internet publications, and, and you had to quickly understand an issue and translate that issue into readers if, for the purpose of readers. And so you get on the phone, you learn, you do the reporting, but you're, you're constantly learning something new. And in some ways, as a journalist, you're dealing a little, with a little bit of uncertainty because you're not, never an expert unless you have the luxury of writing on one thing. You're not the expert at what you're writing on. You're talking to the experts and you're trying to translate the expert's opinions into something that resonates with a reader. I mean, if you think about that from sort of a risk perspective, what we're trying to do in, in you know, all the subjects I just brought up, I'm not an expert in, in how elections work. I'm not an expert in, in right. you know, what the 5G network looks like. Talking to the experts, bounding the technical knowledge, recognizing that there's uncertainty, putting barriers around the uncertainty, and then thinking about what recommendations are going to resonate for the audience, whether you're, it's a policymaker, it's an operator, it's a, it's a somebody who's making financial investments. So, yeah, you know, I, I think it served me well as, as a background. So maybe talk a bit about um, more about the NRMC and what areas um, it specifically has responsibility in overseeing, especially in critical infrastructure protection, um, which obviously is your mission. So if you could just kind of share a bit about that. Sure. So we define the, the key things around what are critical infrastructure risk and, and maintain sort of that definition. Um, so last April, we published a uh, 
a list of 55 national critical functions that are the things that are so important to the nation's economy, national security, community well-being, that they need to be able to function um, for the for the country to be be healthy. And, you know, the reason you define functions is then you think about risks about things that could cause loss of function. And so defining the risk, and then within that, we also sort of manage the, the understanding of what is most critical, which companies are most critical to those functions, which geographic assets and facilities are most critical, whether it's an electricity substation or a telecommunications hotel or, or something like that. And so, you know, we have this lay down conceptually down to the hard asset of these are the things that are most critical from a national security perspective. And we put that information together. And, and a lot of our work is, is the modeling, the information gathering, the technical analysis, and then the, the visualization and, and support of how to lay down knowing what is most critical. And then we apply that knowledge to strategic risk challenges, operational risk challenges that are, that are facing the homeland. So having that rich understanding and then using it so we'll talk a little bit about COVID, I'm sure. What, what's the most critical infrastructure that needs to be working for the country's recovery in response to the pandemic? The, the underlying knowledge allows us to do that and then prioritize within that. Um, so, so a lot of our work is around that area. But then we also do work where something has been deemed to be a national priority and we need to manage the risk to it. Um, we lead the department's efforts to secure, support state election officials in, in, in securing elections. Um, you know, the president of uh, last year declared an emergency in the, the nation's information communications technology supply chain and, and the fact that, you know, we're seeing threats from China and other places. And, and we help put together the plans to address that emergency. Can you just give some examples of some of those 55 different functions? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the functions include things like um, transport goods goods and materials via air, transport goods and materials via rail. So transportation functions, um, mm. communications yep. functions, operate core networks, be able to communicate wirelessly, uh, IT functions, um, but including things like identity management and, and intellectual property development. Um, and then, you know, banking and finance, you know, m maintain a liquidity system, energy, having the ability to generate and transmit electricity, um, extract fuel. So, so it's functions like that that allow us ultimately yep. to create the end state that the lights are on and, and we're communicating with each other. And we can move things around. We can operate a healthcare network. There, there are a number of fu functions that are related to healthcare networks. And it's, it's a good way of framing, again, the things that have to work. And, you know, I know we get it right. If, if, I, if I can look at the list and say, if that thing's not working, that's going to be a bad day for national leadership. And there are right. going to be meetings all over town and everyone's going to be killing themselves to get that thing up and running. And, and so that's a national critical function. And so then it also sounded like what you do is you ultimately um, identify those functions, you reconcile it down to, okay, now in that ecosystem, what are the critical companies and then what are the risks? But it sounds like you, and you said this up front, uh, but you have an advisory role. So then how do you ultimately work with those end companies in elevating those risks, sharing the the data? It's almost like you're a consultant working for the government, going out to these companies um, and and you really probably need to collaborate with them and help them understand why these risks are so important. But can you talk a bit about how you ultimately advise these companies and sure. what you do and how you get their mind around these things? Yeah. So, so you know, I like to use tangible examples. Of, you know, I use tangible examples yeah. of the things we're actually doing. So one yeah. one um, natural critical function is the availability of position navigation and timing services. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of that com comes through global position GPS, you know, through satellites and, and things on your device. But, you know, a lot of critical infrastructure depends on precision, position, navigation, timing. And uh, so that's a function we have through sort of legislative mandate and executive mandate recognize that there's significant risk and we probably don't have as resilient a position navigation timing services as we need. You can trace uh, some threat activity for, from other nation states, maybe as that's a way they may look to, to hit the United States or, or sort of the global order on that. And so let's start, let's talk risk language, right? P&T is a critical function and we believe there are strategic risk. So we need to 
figure out how to make that system more resilient. Um, mm. In this case, the work starts, and as we're talking businesses, there we do a lot of work with sort of the receiver companies and the underlying suppliers of, of P&T. Um, we, we help sort of encourage them to address vulnerabilities in their P&T receivers, give them information about where we, where we see the risk that will lead receivers to be, you know, harder coded and, and, and less likely to be attacked. But that's not the only way you manage risk here in receivers. Perhaps, you know, you're under my underlying concern is sort of single point of failure of the actual of the actual signal coming from a satellite or things like that. We've done a lot of work evaluating backup capabilities for PNT and, you know, there's policy work, R&D investment and, and other incentives to, to establish a, a more rich market-based backup capability. And then the end users of PNT, we're working with them to encourage them to understand their sources of of P and T to understand what they would have, what would happen if, if there's failure and availability to that, to do planning around fail- failure options and to perhaps make investments in backup capabilities. So again, if, if, if the risk of failure is too high for their businesses. And so you, you see in there, I think a pretty good mix of how we generally work with industry, get information out, encourage them to do more, to be more secure and, and, and more resilient based on that information. And, and if that information is not good enough, if that, that encouragement is not pushing them to make business decisions, we try to come up with um, investing in innovation that might change the, might change the cost end of, of some of those business decisions or incentives to encourage them to, to reduce risk. And so, so it's a mix of that. I, I find businesses generally don't want to take too much risk to their core business functions. And if their core business functions matter to national security, we're going to encourage them to do what naturally makes sense to them, take less risk. They may not have the financial wherewithal or the financial incentive to go all the way there. And that's where we look for sort of some innovative solutions to help push them to allow them to do that. Is there anything that you've picked up um, through this process? Because ultimately, there is kind of the art of persuasion. Um, although, as you indicated, these are really important assets. And so for them not to listen to you guys probably wouldn't be a great strategy. But my guess is from time to time, you know, they're like, ah, you know, I get what you're saying, but this isn't a priority for us at this point in time. Is there anything that you would recommend? Because we've got a lot of risk leaders that listen to the podcast around how do you persuade um, another party to make these investments and risks, and how do you do it in a way that resonates with them? I'm guessing that's probably come up from time to time. I've found that you, you start by a sort of a continuing relationship of trust and, and build, building trust, and right, that, that's mm. not, you know, there's nothing profound in, in trust, but you you have to meet industry where they are, understand sort of. The, what drives a business decision, um, recognize that, that some of the t- time, you know, recognize that they're trying to get, do the right thing in their business contexts. Um, right. But it doesn't always get you there. And so you, you talk, you know, I, I'd like to as much as possible talk in terms, in, in business terms of what makes sense. You know, there are things that the government does that, that frustrate businesses in terms of, you know, multiple government agencies working on the same problem, lack of harmonization of regulation, inefficient regulation. And if we can address some of those issues and lower the costs of, of business, if there's less compliance costs, they can put some of that cost to, to security solutions. And so, you know, I, my, my persuasion is, first of all, assume people are trying to do the right thing and want to do the right thing, but, but they're bound by the constraints in their knowledge and try to get to a place where... Um, you know, the decisions work within their constraints. Just thinking about um, some real live examples, you've already kind of touched on some uh, COVID, 5G, state elections. What are some of the, the biggest risks that you see out there right now that you guys are focusing on? Sure. So, you know, first and foremost, the, the, the pandemic and the 2020 elections are, are top of mind right right now for where our energy is as CISA and, and National Risk Management Center are, you know, um, the 2020 elections are obviously going to be uh, really in, important um, sort of to where we are as a democracy. But in the middle of that, we don't want our adversaries to take advantage of, of sort of some of the fundamental things going on and and 
give less confidence in the results of the elections. And we saw in 2016, in a lot of different ways, attack the integrity of our democratic processes. Um, We want to be on the alert. We are on the alert to make sure that doesn't happen again, um, that other adversaries don't don't follow the playbook, and that the voters have confidence that... um, that their votes and their intent or votes are secure and it will be counted accurately and that we will have an accurate election. Um, so, you know, we, we have within CISA just a ton of energy around looking for anything that could undermine um, our democracy. At, at the same time, and, and that sort of overlays with the pandemic, at the same time, again, we are in the middle of, you know, we saw the GDP numbers today, right? We're in the middle wow, of the- yeah. Of time, whether we want to talk about this from an economic perspective or a loss of life perspective, an illness perspective, a community well-being perspective, um, and that stress would be exacerbated if our infrastructure wasn't working. If um, you know, if key critical functions, those functions are all necessary for response and recovery. And you know, the pandemic is not a first-order infrastructure crisis, but but if infrastructure doesn't function we're not going to bounce back from this as quickly and in communities, people, individuals are going to be in worse shape. And so, you know, again, looking at, looking at the infrastructure, working with industry to make sure essential workers can work and commodities are being delivered. And, you know, the economic conditions are such that power and water and banking finance systems keep working. So, so that's a lot of my focus right now. And on top of that, again, are, are sort of, Things that, that other governments might look to do or adversaries might look to do to take advantage of, of some of the, some of the current stress we're, we're dealing with as a country. Can you talk a bit about, um, I guess the interdependencies that exist between public and private industries and how you work with them? Because obviously, you know, many of the most important, uh, organizations that, that manage our infrastructure are private organizations. Could you talk about kind of those interdependencies? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, let, let's use power and communications companies. So, so, um, whether it's electricity, let's electricity providers, communications companies. Um, both of those are run by, you know, largely put together by the private sector with federal investment in creating those networks in some order of, of federal and, and state requirements to deliver a level of resilience and delivery. And so, and so from the get-go, power utilities, communications companies can't work without government policy enabling them. And so these are, while private, privately run, you know, it has been federal policy and federal state policy that have enabled these systems to, to work strongly. So we are interdependent with each other. Um, and so when you talk about, you know, let's go with the power companies, when you talk about the power grid and cybersecurity becomes more important, we have to have an information sharing structure where we, we let the power companies know what we know and that they can then build in practices in, to help secure the grid. Um, we invest as a federal government in, in innovation that can then just be operationalized by the, by the utilities themselves. Um, we, we share information with them. We collect intelligence to understand if things are going to attack. We work with them to sort of scan and understand vulnerabilities to the system. And, and then, you know, there's at this level of state and local government where some of that cost costs utilities more money, which means they're spending more money to deliver power. The consumer is going to ultimately have to bear some of the cost for that investment in resilience. And, and you got to work with the, the public utility commissions to make sure that the cost is accurately passed on to the consumer. So, so it is a, you know, it is a fully interdependent relationship. Um, the good thing we've been able to do over the last 15 years that we, we lean on against CISA is we've set up the structure where CISA and the Department of Energy work closely with the utilities and state governments to have these, put, put together these plans, have these strategy conversations, talk about vulnerabilities collectively we work together mm. you know, i have the opportunity to sit sit with ceos of, of a lot of the major pu- public utilities along with the department of energy and talk through all of this stuff and hear from them what, what's going to help them build a more resilient and cyber secure grid and you know you know work through that process together and it becomes a partnership it becomes it becomes a running conversation and you know i, I going back to where it started i think that's what we got to have you know at right. this point, if our adversaries are going to attack 
our power system, our power system is part of our national security. And we have to bring those utilities into our national security dialogue and get them the information tools they need to protect themselves against a foreign government. So, Bob, one of the things you talked about, which I find fascinating, is being in these meetings, sitting down with some of these um, CEOs and talking to them about the risks um, of potential decisions that they're making or risks to their infrastructure. One of the things that I think is critical, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is um, the risks associated with certain strategic decisions that the CEOs make. Um, and obviously, there are downstream impacts potentially to our infrastructure. Um, do you ever give guidance in how um, CEOs and other leaders, especially in the private sector, should think about those risks when they are thinking through strategies? And and I'm really interested in this because I've spent a lot of time in strategic risk over the last several years. Um, and what we oftentimes find is some of the biggest and most important risks that an organization faces is because of the choices that they make and their strategy yeah. and the choices that they don't. So if you could touch on that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so, so let me give you a tangible example of something we're studying right now. Um, related, and we're doing it with industry and government working together, but re- related to the pandemic, you saw that certain availability of certain commodities was stressed and not certain um, because you know, maybe where the manufacturing is done and it's, it's done, you, you know, uh, somewhere around the world, there's a lot of manufacturing going on in Asia, for example, and right. you know, there become sort of single points of failure. If you can't get something from Asia to, um, to the U S perhaps you, you, you can't do something from a business perspective. And, and of course the decisions, you know, Deloitte knows this well, the, the folks, you, you folks know it well. Of course, there have been business decisions along the way to, you know, manufacture things where, where it's cheapest or to not have redundant manufacturing capability, redundant sourcing, things like that, and, and do more just in time delivery and, and all that. And ultimately, that's created a less resilient um, supply chain for commodities and you know, if you lose trust in where things are manufactured for whatever reason, it could also um, create a less secure supply chain. And so economic drivers, market drivers, business factors have been the reason that a lot of those decisions were made. Um, now's a moment, and I think companies recognized it either that they were stressed or they, they were close enough to being stressed in, in the middle of the pandemic that maybe they had baked out um, too much resilience or, or there, there was they were too lean. And so right. I think there's a willingness by industry. And so we're studying this now. We've, we're actually using a public-private task force that, that I co-chair to do a study. There's a willingness but from industry to be maybe a little bit less lean in their supply chains or think about um, you know tightening their supply, shortening their supply chains, their value chains around that. And there's government industry conversation about, you know, if you're going to do that, how do you do it in the way that's going to leave us the, the function in the strongest way? And what can the government do to help encourage that to happen? And what are, what are the factors that, that make it less likely to happen? And can we remove some of the barriers? And so, yeah, we're giving advice in that area. We're, we're listening. And ultimately, we, we hopefully will be in the business of reducing some of the barriers to more effectively and efficiently build stronger supply chains, logistics chains. That, I love that example because obviously I, I have a lot of clients that have actually dealt with that over the last four or five months. Um, I'm curious, is there anything, um, any tangible uh, examples of a tool or a process or a way to kind of assess those risks that you've seen? And, and one that we are seeing a lot more interest from our clients, and we've been talking to them about it for years, but it's really catching on now, is, is uh, scenario planning um, so that you could begin to see, you know, because of these uncertainties, how could some of these scenarios play out? Um, which is a good way to identify, you know, using your supply chain. I mean, if the organization did um, robust scenario planning, you know, they potentially could have seen a future where their supply chains were constrained. Are there any other tools or things that you guys are looking at that, you know, if you're listening to this, that you'd recommend, you know, a risk leader uh, potentially adopt or look at? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it is still tools around illumination and, and pulling out data and, and getting deeper in, into sort of understanding how the complex chains work. Um, and so yep. a lot of our conversations start with um, 
encouraging, we're doing this for our own purposes, encouraging a better understanding of how, what is the most valuable thing in your system and, and some ability to evaluate that, and then how that valuable thing's produced and, and illuminating that and taking advantage of what's known and what can be gleaned from that you know, what's important within the illumination to make trust judgments. And so, uh, you know, I think there's a lot there. And then as, as part of making trust judgments, kind of setting up uh, or confidence judgments, right? Setting up metrics to, to evaluate. But but I'm pretty bullish on, you know, the evolution of our ability to understand complex systems and pull data at real time to test test how those complex systems are working. What I really want to do as a National Risk Management Center is bring some of that innovation that I think is largely going on outside of government, yeah. bring that within government, take advantage of, of, of that system and, and scale it so it's, it's, a, it's easier to do. Well, you just touched on one of the biggest issues my clients quite frankly had, and that was how do you get data real time when these risks are unfolding or these crises are unfolding, you know, just simple things like uh, where do our employees live? Um, you know, what devices do they have? I mean, just simple things like that. My, my clients struggled with that. Not that they didn't have the information or the data. It just wasn't available um, real time or in a manner that allowed them to consume it so that they could make better decision making. So I love the fact that you, you touched on that. Yeah. I, I mean, you can't be a homeland security person without recommending planning and, ex- and testing and exercising, right? <laughs> Some of this is simple, but it's like, I mean, you're talking about scenario planning, but go, you know, down from scenario planning, which is sort of alternative world planning, also into scenarios that you're most concerned about through that. Right. And really go through the discipline of testing, whether you get a plan in place to deal with that scenario, whether you can pull information and, right. A, a pandemic was wholly in, in the realm of something that should be in, um, people who have the ability to make an investment in continuity planning. It should have been in continuity plans. I hope it was in continuity plans. Right. It should be tested from time to time. And, you know, I think one of the things we did see, and I I assume you saw this with a lot of your clients, a lot of global businesses were, had had thought through the pandemic scenario. Obviously any one scenario, COVID is different than, than the pandemic maybe you planned against, but had thought through how they would do business. And I think it served us well. Yeah, one of the things I think took my clients by surprise wasn't necessarily the pandemic, because I think we all knew that it potentially was going to happen. Um, it was shutting down, you know, the economy and essentially having every one of your workers, yeah. you know, especially in areas that traditionally had not been able to do things virtually. Now they have to. Oh, and by the way, we have to do this, you know, within 48 hours. Um, I think that was the that was the black swan, if you will, um, that my clients didn't necessarily plan for. Um, yeah, no, interesting. It's, it's interesting, right? It, it's, it was the, it's the policy interventions on top of the pandemic that got guided all of this. And yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, th- that goes back to sort of public and private and doing it together. Like if we're in the same room having this conversation. Oh, you know, and I've, I've been in this room with a lot of different industry at different stages. Here's what the government's going to do in response to this happening. And if you're not planning for what the government's going to do in response to what's happening, (laughs) certain, then you're not planning for what's happening, right? Exactly, exactly. And 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 did I'm just curious did did the crisis and COVID and everything that's happened over the last four or five months has it changed how you look at um, the critical infrastructure risk environment? I know that you think about this a lot, so my guess is you probably have done a lot of thinking. But but has the has the crisis changed any of your thinking? Um, yeah, you know, a crisis, if, if you're not paying attention, all crises should change your thinking a little, a little yeah. bit. I mean, I, I think, you know, planning for catastrophe, planning for high consequence events, low probability events, yeah. and bringing that into um, operations, you know, is, is something that the closer you are, are to something happening, you want, you want to make sure that that continues to happen. Um, so, so that's one area. I mean, in terms of critical infrastructure, you, you know, it, it, it gives you sort of a, a new understanding of sources of what's really important from an infrastructure perspective. And, you know, I, I think for obvious reasons, public health infrastructure perhaps needs to be a bigger priority coming out of this. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the supply chain things that, that think a little bit differently with it. You know, we, we've been... I think it's been pretty impressive to see kind of the communications and IT 
underlying infrastructure surge to meet the change in the, the way we're all working and or a, a lot of us are working in the way communities are interacting. And that, that's an area where early on, you know, we anticipated be it being a significant source of risk and perhaps problems um, and, you know, feel pretty good about how, how our core infrastructure has functioned. What, what about, what is your advice to um, leaders on low likelihood, higher consequence risks? You, you touched on that. Yeah. Um, what advice, and, and part of the thing that always fascinates me is um, you can do a lot of planning, but oftentimes you don't know what the next, you know, um, yeah. you know low probability, high impact risk is. Um, what's your thoughts on that? What are you telling leaders? It, it comes down to leaving space for some thinking and investment and making sure. And I, I hope I will never have the opportunity. I won't make this mistake or, or, you know, we'll learn this lesson that you always got to reserve s some level of investment to think about, you know, the worst case to your function, if you're really interested in creating a resilient organization. And so carving out some of that um, and, you know, and I use carve out intentionally because if you don't carve it out, right, it just gets slowly, merge back into thinking about normal operations and just doing a, a basic risk calculation on a day-to-day -day basis. So you gotta, you gotta allow for s some space for that and, mm -hmm. you know, t testing the, th the thinking in there. And so a lot of it is really about make, making the investment around these things and stress testing, right. And, and picking some version of representative scenarios of the things that are really risky for your business and making sure you stress test it annually, whatever the scenario is on there. And so, and, so and, and then, you know, part of investment is then you might have to have a little bit of excess capacity. Um, right. In different things. So you might have, right. You might have to have things that over a 10 year period, you don't extract any value out of it. And how do you build that into your, your books? Right. Um, but you got to think about that. Yeah, I'd say one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that the next time a leader says, oh, that will never happen, <laughs> you have this basis to say, well, actually something like that did. And I do think um, another thing that I would add to your response is even having um, creating the space and time to have substantive conversations with yeah. leaders, um, because yeah, obviously you can put together the greatest analysis in the world, but if they're not looking at it, taking it seriously, and if it's not impacting decisions they make, obviously, um, you know, it's not going to make the impact. No, I, mean, really want. I think the process is really important and the connection between the people who are doing this thinking and the leader, the board, the, the C-suite, whatever, you, you know, I go back to some of what we saw in the, to, to social media companies in 2016 and in, in some of what we saw in terms of adversaries using social media as an attack vector. And it wasn't that there weren't people in the social media companies that didn't see this as a possibility. It's that that risk maybe didn't get the attention it needed at the, the highest level. And, you know, almost anything that ever happens, there's an example of somebody somewhere in the bowels of government or in organizations like, yeah, I've been t telling you about that forever. But how does that, you know, what's the process that gets that in front of the board and the C-suite, make sure it gets the right consideration. And it, you know, this is risk governance. This this is really thinking about enterprise risk management programs, and so I want to keep preaching. You know, the importance of doing that. You mentioned five G earlier. There's you know a tremendous amount of innovation in our world, which is great because that's how the economy grows and you know organizations thrive. Um, but obviously, that probably creates new risks. And and can you talk maybe, especially from an infrastructure? perspective in a cyber perspective, um, what are some of the implications of these new innovative approaches? Sure. So for, so I think a lot of what you're, you're sort of asking about, Mike, is, is kind of disruption of the way think services are delivered. Um, right. You know, if you want to get to the sort of simple, simple technical level, right, we, we start to be, care a little more about software than hardware. You know, that's what 5G is going on. We start to care yep. a little bit more about data and how data flows to Things, things get more automated, right? It becomes a less you know, analog manual world. And so let's just run with software, right? And software yep. assurance, software security, software transparency, all of a sudden become a real high priority from a security perspective. And, and you know, that, that's, 
a whole new vector of how do you create software security. That's not the same thing as, as taking a, a device and hardening the device or, or you know, isolating. So, so you know, I, I think th- that's how we're trying to understand, you know, what what are the major trends? And they're all cliched at this point, AI and machine yeah. learning. Yeah. Smart, smart automation and, and all that good stuff, Internet of Things. But that's all changing the fundamental way that infrastructure is going to operate and creating different exposures. You know, one of the benefits of all that, I think, is more ability to on the fly isolate um, so that yep. things don't cascade. And, you know, I think there's going to be real secure, secure benefits of that if you if you can keep an attack from sort of being existential because you've created more diversity of the way things are automated. I think it's going to make security easier to do in some ways, but it's going to create new exposure and new, new vulnerabilities. We talked about a lot about the, the crisis that we've been going through. What can owners and operators of infrastructure do to better prepare for the next crisis? Meaning, and it may be things that we were talking about, you know, in advance of, of COVID, um, but maybe that there's emerging things that they could do. But what are you, what are you recommending? And obviously, that's a very broad question, but are there, you know, a few top things that, that owners and operators should be thinking about? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, 40 minutes or so into this, I think. I, I don't know that I have a new answer to this. Um, it is bringing risk thinking in, in, in security risk and resilience thinking into their enterprise risk processes so that it, it gets baked into conversations about where investments are going to be made in, in, in trade-offs at, at, at the highest levels. I think that's a really important element of the whole thing. It is planning. It is exercise. It's testing. I mean, I'd yep. like to see every board mandate exercises in critical infrastructure and certain exercises and then do something with the, with the after action and its findings. Um, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't urge set up public, you know, set up partnerships with government, right. work with folks like us at the cybersecurity infrastructure security agency, share information, you know, no, right. You, you never want to meet your government partners who are going to help you deal with a, an incident the day of the incident, right? Make sure you've established <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of programs that um, companies can take advantage of. So, you know, make all this, make risk thinking part of your culture, but, and, and bring it into, you know, trade-offs, but, but you do some investments in reducing risk. So Bob, I've got a final few questions. I call this yeah. my lightning round. What would you say, you know, is the top one or two qualities of a resilient leader? Um, you know, in some ways it's optimism, right? In, in some ways it is, that you get in the middle of, of this and you've got a problem solving bent and you're optimistic that with, with attention um, you can do something to, to make things better. Right. And so, and so, you know, I think I, to me, resilience is fundamentally an optimistic concept. I think another aspect of resilient leader, it's the ability to communicate and have trust. You, you know, you build up trust and you bank it and then you use it in uh-huh. the middle of a crisis. Right. And it goes back to knowing people and everything. Well, I will say you gave the best answer, my favorite, maybe I shouldn't say best, um, my favorite answer to this question. I think I've now heard it after, I don't know, 50 or 60 interviews, maybe from one or two people. Um, And that is, it's optimistic. Like you cannot, you cannot be resilient if you don't have hope for the future. I just don't think that those two things can, can live together because ultimately it is about leading your people. It's about making tough decisions. It's about doing difficult things. And if you don't have hope that there is a better world tomorrow, um, you can't be resilient in my opinion. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and I probably just went over 30 seconds. What's the one thing, and you could take this at a very focused level, or if you want to take it at a higher level, is what's the one thing that you would change about how risk is managed? And I'm going to say and it could be for owners and operators with infrastructure, um, but if you want to take it at a higher level, you can as well. I think I start with not thinking about it as a quantification or a technical thing for how risk gets managed. Risk is a way of thinking, um, and it's really ultimately about choosing the right mitigation strategies in the middle of uncertainty. And so I don't know if I would change what I would change, but, but always focus on mitigation strategies in the face of uncertainty. And then you're using the analysis to narrow the uncertainty. I, I love that because one of the things that I find, it's probably one of my number one recommendations to my clients is 
oftentimes you get risk that is a separate, obviously a separate function from, you know, the folks that are leading the organization. But the biggest challenge I oftentimes have is you got to make it consumable and the leaders themselves have to have a risk mindset. It's not like something that you can delegate. And quite frankly, that's oftentimes what we see in a lot of organizations is that it's not connected to the core decision making of the business. Um, and it's oftentimes something that the leader obviously takes into consideration, but doesn't leverage or utilize the incredible assets that the risk management group may have. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's simply about making better decisions with the information that that you know is presented. So I love that answer too. Okay, last question. What do you think is the greatest opportunity um, for the nation and or our business leaders um, to become more resilient in the future? Uh, um, That's a good one. Um, You know, let's go, let's go back and, and think about just being dedicated toward, you know, making the right investments, creating the right culture, um, and putting it in the right level priorities. And so, so I mean, that's where the opportunity is. Um, again, a lot of this is connecting risk and resilience thinking with strategy and financial thinking. And, and I think that's where there's yep. an opportunity. Well, I think that's a great place to end it because I, I could not agree more on that answer. Uh, Bob, thank you very much. This was, uh, I always find these so educational, especially, um, you know, somebody that has dedicated his career and his life to risk management. Uh, so I appreciate your time today. Um, you're welcome. And thanks for having me. As you can tell, I enjoy these conversations. So I appreciate it. <laughs> Bob, wow, that was incredible. Thank you very much. I'll tell you, I learned a lot about the risks that really are out there that could impact what we all probably take for granted, our infrastructure. We have covered a lot of topics over the last few months. And like I said at the beginning, we have a number of topics and guests that we're gonna continue to bring to you. But I will say what's most important to me is hearing what you wanna hear about. So if there's any topics or guests that you would like us to bring on Resilient, hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter. I've also been getting a lot of feedback, which is tremendously helpful as we continue to prioritize our backlog. For more insights across all aspects of COVID-19, just go to Deloitte.com on our COVID-19 page. You can also listen to the Resilient Podcast on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and even Spotify. Until next time, stay safe and remain resilient. Resilient.